Ards are great, but they're also quite lonely places. I mean, I personally wish that I had friends, or at least a friend, who would be willing to join me for one. But, you know, none of them have responded to my invites yet. I have very few friends who are into that, apparently. In fact, since I started inviting them, I've had very few friends, full stop. But this was not necessarily the case for the long dead Romans, for whom a bath was somewhere where you would go to the gym, go to eat, go to drink, go to socialize, go to worship the gods, and go to do business. Like many things, communal bathing came to Rome from Greece, and had really increased in popularity in the era of the late Republic through to the early Empire. This was a time when the Romans were really getting used to the unprecedented amount of wealth many of them had acquired, and a lot of them now had tastes for the finer things in life. The construction of aqueducts into the city had facilitated the building of many of these large communal baths, and they were joined by theatres, arenas, and an increasing amount of foreign goods making their way into the heartland of the empire. Rome really was the place to be at the time. It all starts with a man called Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, who was famous as the guy who built many of the aqueducts and roads that Rome was famous for, and, uh, oh yeah, a giant fucking inland lake where he could secretly train a navy. But yeah, bath building, the construction of the first large permanent bathhouses in the city of Rome, was done by Agrippa, probably towards the end of his life. Skip forward a little over half a century, and the appetite Romans had developed for bathing had led this good-looking and promising young artist here to build another bath complex in the city. And this one was even bigger and more luxurious. The Roman poet Marshall praised it, saying, What worse than Nero, but what better than his baths? Trajan, Caracalla, Diocletian, Constantine, all of them built bath complexes in Rome. Which is kind of wild when you think about it, because even as the empire's stability was decreasing, and the actual city of Rome declined in relevance, people were still building bathhouses there, which is crazy. Which was great for the Romans, because bathing was awesome. I mean, it wasn't awesome at uh, actually getting you clean. A lot of this water was so filthy that I imagine you would actually leave it dirtier than you would get into it. The poet Marshall even has a couple of unpleasant anecdotes about times certain bodily fluids managed to make their way into the water. In fact, the filth of some of these baths was so great that it was apparently fairly well known that you shouldn't go to them if you had an open wound. That was just asking for an infection. The emperor Marcus Aurelius was so repulsed by the filthiness of them that he was disgusted by the idea of going to a public bath. Maybe the emperor was a germaphobe. Although, it would have been difficult, germ theory wouldn't be discovered for fucking centuries yet. Or, maybe it has to do with the fact that the Emperor Marcus was a famous introvert, and going to the baths would have involved seeing a lot of people. Because, like I said, Roman bathing was a very social affair. People were known to spend entire days in the baths just chatting away. Which could get awkward sometimes, because everyone was nude. And even though the Romans were perhaps a little more comfortable with public nudity than, say, we are today, not every Roman was a born naturist. We have some stories of men who wouldn't go to the baths at the same time as other people for fear that their bodies might do that thing that male bodies do when they get excited. The poet Marshall even talks about times when particularly well-endowed men would walk into the main room, and everyone would give them a round of applause. He also has a couple of anecdotes about particularly self-conscious women, who would have quite possibly been bathing in the same room as him. Throughout Roman history, baths were segregated or not segregated by sex. In the first century, for example, it seems that men and women bathed together, whilst later baths often had separate rooms to keep the two apart. But even when men and women were kept separate, the baths were still a sexually charged place. Shocker, I know that a room in which everyone is together naked in ancient Rome might turn into an orgy. I'd like you to hold on to your shock for a minute. But there was a lot of money to be made if you could buy rooms near the bathhouses and then rent them out to lovers who had met in the leisure complex. This particular aspect of bathing life will be important later on. There were actually lots of ways one could make money as part of these uh, bathhouses. They were huge, huge leisure complexes, so they didn't just have the baths. There were masseuses, there were food venues, 
There were gymnasiums, there were even libraries in some of them. We know this because the first century philosopher Seneca actually lived next to some baths for a while and wrote to a friend moaning about the noise. He complains about the songs that people sing when they're in the bath together. He complains about the noise of the food vendors trying to sell their wares. He complains about the shrieks of men and women who are having their body hair plucked by trained slaves. But Seneca was a Stoic philosopher, which is Latin for miserable old git. So we'll ignore him for now and return to his point of view and other people who disagree with the Baths for some reason or another later on. But it wasn't just those living in the capital that got to enjoy the Baths. Like any imperial power, Rome spread the benefits of its culture to the regions that it conquered. Even the farthest reaches of the empire could enjoy such Roman things as baths, theatre, literacy, and the utter annihilation of entire peoples. Even the barbarous Britons got in on the action. Britain was, and still is, a small, wet, grey, and generally unpleasant island full of small, wet, grey, and unpleasant people such as myself. But the Romans came here anyway, and to help turn the locals into good proper Romans, they built them a bath. A bath so big and famous, there is still a city named after it today. But that's not what the Romans called it. On Roman maps it appears as Aquae Sulis, or Waters of Sulis, and here lies another important aspect of the Roman baths. As well as being a leisure centre for the ancients, and a great example to the locals of what Rome had to offer them, the baths were also an opportunity, like pretty much everything else in Roman life, to perform a little bit of religio. The baths of Bath were particularly significant in this regard because they doubled up as a temple to Minerva Sulis. You see, the original settlement was built on top of what had been a Celtic shrine to the goddess Sulis, who the Romans equated with their goddess Minerva, or Athena if you're Greek. Take a Celtic goddess, take a Greco-Roman goddess, boom! You have a combined deity right there. And this was a great propaganda move. The impressive actual building of the bathhouse would have been an excellent example of Roman power and the strength of Roman civilization, whilst the temple might have acted as a form of reassurance to the local Britons that their way of life wasn't going to be completely eradicated, just maybe Romanized a little bit. The timing of the construction of these baths is also quite significant because it seems to have taken place in the decade following both the massacre of the Druids and Boudicca's failed uprising, which perhaps suggests that the Baths were acting as a symbol of reconciliation between the new Roman leaders and the natives who had just had their freedom taken away. So there we have it. The Romans conquered an empire and built everyone a bath, and they all lived happily ever after. Except that's obviously not quite right, because after Constantine, for some reason or another, bath building kind of just stops. I mean, sure, Constantinople had baths, and it's not like everyone just stopped washing after the 5th century or something like that, but the bath culture, the practice of spending literally all day in a pre-modern spa, for all intents and purposes, did kind of fade away. The emperors stopped building new, huge, lavish bath complexes, and the ones that had already been built largely fell into disrepair. I mean, to be fair to them, Rome was going through a lot at the time. Parts of the empire had even fallen away, like, you know, the entire fucking western half of it. And it was in these places, like for example Britain, which was abandoned around 407 CE, where the baths just fell apart when the Romans left. In Britain's case, there was good reason for this. There's fairly good evidence that southern England became an incredibly violent place after the departure of the Romans. In fact, many Roman buildings were demolished so that the materials could be repurposed to make new fortified settlements for a population that was in much more danger than they had been a hundred years beforehand. And it's unlikely that the Saxon newcomers had any use for these Roman baths, which by time they'd settled in England had already fallen very much into disrepair. So was that it for Bath then? The Romans were out and the Germans were in, and now suddenly no one wants to wash with each other anymore? Well, possibly that had something to do with it, but it might be a little more complicated than that, because there is fairly good evidence that the baths were already falling into a state of decay before the Romans abandoned the island. Now, it is hard to tell when the actual building itself was abandoned, because there's no evidence outside of speculation that would lead us to a conclusion that the temple, the gymnasium, and the actual bathhouse all fell into disuse at the same time. But the shrine, that oh-so-important shrine to Minerva Sulis, that seems to have decayed fairly far in the century prior 
to the abandonment of Britain. So what was happening in this prior century that might have led to this? Well, the Roman Empire of the 4th century had undergone massive, massive change to all aspects of it. The society itself, the military, the government, all of them would have been unrecognisable to Romans living in the High Empire 200 years beforehand. But the biggest change, at least regarding long-term impact, was the abandonment of many of the traditional Roman cults in favour of a new religion... Shit, wrong holy book. Christianity. In the year 313, Constantine had officially recognised the religion as having legal status in the empire. He protected it with the law and then converted himself. And then over the next 70 years or so, Christianity ascends to a position of cultural dominance in the empire until finally the Emperor Theodosius declares it to be the official state religion. From the 380s through to the 5th century, Rome underwent a period of intense conversion and destruction. The Serapeian of Alexandria was demolished, along with many other pagan temples, Zoroastrian temples, Jewish synagogues. All of these suffered violence at the hands of religious fanatics, which now had the backing of the church and the imperial house. Hypatia, one of the last classical philosophers, and part of a class that had once whispered in the ears of the emperors, was lynched in the street. Now, I don't want to make out like all 4th and 5th century Christians were violent religious fanatics. I mean, many of the victims of these purges were Christians themselves, who happened to be unlucky enough to be part of a sect that had just been declared heretical. But it does show that the 4th and 5th centuries in Rome were partly characterised by a conscious departure from the pagan past, which sometimes manifested in the form of violence. And baths were high on the list of things that Romans of the past had loved and many Christians now took issue with. Many church fathers had criticised bathing prior to the 4th century. Tertullian, for example, saw the baths, richly decorated with mosaics and statues of pagan deities, and was sickened. This was self-evidently just a breeding ground for demons. Clement of Alexandria was horrified by how easily the baths would lead people into sinful, promiscuous sex. As we mentioned earlier, nearly everyone was nude, and men and women would often bathe in the same place. Even the statues were naked for God's sake. How awful, thought Clement. Did these people not know that it is from looking that men get to loving? By the 4th century, church scholars like St. Jerome and John Chrysostom were openly denouncing the bathhouses. They would turn good Christian men into weak, effeminate types, more susceptible to demons. After all, once one had washed in Christ, why ever wash again? Not all Christians were so anti-cleanliness. After all, it is apparently right next to godliness. Although the ascetic lifestyle was increasing in popularity in this time, it was still far from the norm. Augustine was a Christian, and a miserable old bastard at that, but he still loved a good bath. And, you know, it wasn't necessarily the bathing that a lot of these Christians were taking issue with. It was the building that the bathhouse was in. Roman bathhouses were gorgeous buildings with painted mosaics and statues depicting mythological scenes or particular gods and goddesses. And, as we mentioned earlier, quite often shrines to those pagan deities. And although not every bathhouse was actively destroyed, some of them just fell into disrepair, a lot of their artwork was. And it was a bit of a theme of the late 4th and 5th centuries that Christian zealots were going nuts for statue removal. And this might explain why the baths of Aquae Sulis fell into disrepair before the Romans had even left Britain. In prior times, the Roman state would have provided funds for the upkeep of these pagan altars, but with the ascension of Christianity, no longer. Although there are signs of violent damage in the uh, Roman ruins in Bath, there's nothing to suggest that this was Christian zealotry and not just regular old raiding or, you know, perhaps intentional demolition so that the materials could be repurposed. I think a much more likely idea is that the altar just fell into disrepair on account of the fact that no one wanted to fund it anymore. Probably because it had just lost relevance to the locals. Sure, they still used the baths, but no one gave a shit about the statue of the goddess anymore. And so the golden age of social body washing, I guess, ended, which is, you know, Fine, I suppose. If I really wanted to have a bath with a bunch of strangers, 
I could always go on holiday to a part of the world where they still do that. Or, you know, visit a swimming pool or something. And remember, the next time you invite someone to share some stagnant, filthy water with you for an entire afternoon, and they respond with something rude like, Ew, no, that's weird. Stop inviting me to these kinds of things. We haven't spoken in four years. How many times have I had to tell you this breakup was final? Please get out of my house. Take solace in the fact that your ancestors, who have been dead for 2,000 years, would have loved to get in the water with you. And then, I don't know, find some happiness in that somehow. Thanks for watching.